Welcome to today's MARA Colloquium, Professional Ethics for Records and Information Professionals. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Norman Meridian. He's the Vice President of Information and Compliance at Cook Author Incorporated. Uh, you have seen his bio and also a description of the uh, presentation already, so I won't read this, but I did want to point out that he has a dual career, which I think is, is fascinating. He's combined the information professional side of things with the philosophical and ethics side of things, and we, we do need that holistic approach to anything we're doing now. So um, because we're a little short on time, I'll keep my introduction a little short and uh, introduce you right now to Norman, who will take it away. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Great. Well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about RIM ethics. Uh, I think of RIM ethics as a kind of professional ethics for records managers or records and information professionals. And I think of uh, RIM professionals as, in, of course, including records uh, professionals, but also IT disciplines that support uh, records uh, C capture records, records management in some function. And here I have in mind, for example, the disciplines that make up uh, AIM and, uh, and, and the technologies that are part of AIM. I'll start by giving a kind of overview of, of the topic today and how I'm going to cover things. I do have a, a fair amount that I'm trying to put into this one session, so forgive me if I move kind of fast and I want to save time for questions. First thing I'll do is start with some general questions about the responsibilities of records professionals. And those responsibilities are responsibilities as persons, as you know, members of society, uh, as employees of uh, for-profit organizations or non-profit organizations or, or, or public agencies, and as professionals, specifically as people who are members of the, the records profession. Then after a few motivating questions and, and, and a sample issue, uh, I'll launch into describing what RIM ethics is, kind of give a high level view of its central issues, and describe why it's important for uh, records and information professionals, why it's important for them individually and for their careers. Then I'll talk, uh, kind of this is the, the more philosophical part, I'll talk about moral knowledge and professional ethics and where where it fits in and uh, kind of give a high level of, of all of those, moral knowledge, professional ethics, and, and, uh, and, and business ethics. And then uh, I'll move into the phase where I'll, I'll dig a little more deeply into uh, records ethics, as a, again, as a professional ethics, and draw some comparison with some allied information professions. And if, if I have time at the end, I'll, I'll say a little something about capacity building, uh, although that could come out in questions as well. Here, I want to start with a quote. This is the first, this is the only slide I'll actually simply read out loud, but I want to, want to start with this. This is from um, a book that's relatively recent called Ethics and Accountability, uh, Record Keeping in a Dangerous World, and this is from the foreword. And the question is, uh, given what records professionals do and the access to evidence they have, just what are their ethical responsibilities? Should they be whistleblowers? And a general theme of this book is that the records manager, uh, the records professional, the archivist is, is in a risk position in ways they weren't before because of you know, developments in, 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 in the corporate public, uh, the commercial world, the, the corporate scandals like Enron, and, and, and more recently before this book was written, the, the financial meltdown, and, and of course 9-11. And so the idea is that records managers are now in a, in a, in a more uh, tenuous or dangerous position vis-a-vis -vis records and law than they, they were before. And one reason for that is that uh, you know, the information technology has exploded and there's so much information to capture and manage and records managers are in the middle of that. So there's a lot more that they see now, things they didn't see before, they, they see now through information systems and, uh, and the, the kinds of records they capture. In the past, uh, corporate wrongdoing was often done uh, audibly with your own voice in rooms and with paper. Now it's mediated through email, through now mobile devices and all sorts of systems that make it possible for it to be detected by those who manage those systems. And again, records information managers are in the, in the middle of that. 
Also, with all the, the data being created in organizations, records managers are now stewards for much more data and data that has more risks associated with it. And so they're stewards for uh, the privacy rights of the data owners or the individuals. They are stewards of intellectual property, of confidentiality. And so all these things now create responsibilities for records managers. And with responsibilities come risks. And the kinds of risks, to use categorical terms, are risks of moral and legal negligence, uh, risks of complicity, and even risks of direct wrongdoing. So um, that is one of the motivating situational factors for, uh, for records, man records managers and RIM professionals in general. Now I'm going to use the case of whistleblowing as a kind of motivating case in part because it's it's one that sort of highlights the risk and it also brings a, a few different issues together. Uh, whistleblowing is a, a very difficult situation for all, all employees and, and it's on the rise because in a, in a way uh, corporate wrongdoing or the detection of, of corporate wrongdoing is on the rise. Uh, whistleblowing is a difficult situation. Um, a whistleblower finds himself or herself in a position where they become aware of wrongdoing of some sort and uh, attempt to communicate that to the internal channels and, and then find uh, if those channels aren't responsive, they, they have a dilemma, a moral dilemma as to whether to go out of those channels and report to uh, other authorities within the organization or, or authorities outside the organization. It's a very difficult moral issue because uh, one, it pits loyalty uh, to the organization um, against duty to the, the public. It may require breaching, uh, suspending, or you know, intervening in some way with, with confidentiality or trade secret uh, promises uh, or obligations one has. Uh, and also there's a personal issue, there's a personal cost. Uh, whistleblowing is extremely difficult even though there are more and more laws uh, addressing whistleblowing and providing protections and rewards. So the, the, the situation of whistleblowing is very difficult. People often lose their jobs, uh, they're retaliated against in the organization, sometimes their, uh, their careers are damaged. So. Um, the situation of whistleblowing creates a, a moral and personal problem uh, for individuals. Now, the screenshot I have is just meant to illustrate a recent case. I heard about this on uh, public radio as I was driving, and it was very local. And basically, it, it was it's very typical of whistleblowing issues or the kind of wrongdoing that's reported. A, uh, uh, some employees were making false claims about their work and so they were really absconding money from the organization and very importantly they were false, falsifying what I take to be safety records uh, which can raise risks for the um, uh, for the for the public as well, so the taxpayers uh, jeopardized by this activity, and the and the public who use if this is a transportation system, uh, who, who use that are are at risk. And so I want to kind of use this case too to reflect on where a records uh, professional might fit into this picture. Uh, this might have been reported by a line of work person, another engineer, but you can imagine a records professional having a system that tracks. Uh, records on submittals of, of uh, you know, inspection, you know, material and that kind of thing and realizing that some of those are missing or that they've been changed in some way. Now they have a, a question as to how to deal with this and, and who to go to. So the whistleblowing situation arises in this way. You, you, don't, you don't ask for it, you don't look for it, but uh, all of a sudden you, you become aware of it, of a, of a situation. Um, okay, um, so let me, let me just now talk about uh, come from the high level what, what records and uh, records information management uh, ethics is. Uh, as I said at the outset, it's a kind of professional ethics. Professional ethics I think of as systems of rules that address the specific situations that professionals faced in doing the kind of work that they do in, 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 you know, in their practices within the kinds of organizations they, they work for. And these rules develop as a kind of application of our general morality as difficult, uh, difficult situations are, 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 uh, arise and arise through the, the, the profession and what it does and maybe the technologies that it uses and how, how those develop. 
examples of professions with professional ethics include, this is just a, a limited list, accounting, engineering, journalism, medicine, law, librarianship, and uh, you know, other, other disciplines as well. And each of these has their own sets of issues and core values. You know, medicine, for example, has issues concerning use of biotechnology, access to medicine. A big issue in medical ethics is end-of-life treatment and end-of-life decision. Journalism has issues about deception, about privacy, about falsification of, of information, so forth and so on. Engineering has issues about, about risk and due diligence. So every, every profession uh, has its own, own ethics dealing with the kinds of issues that are important to it and the kind of risks that are um, prominent in it. This slide is a high-level view of uh, the kinds of issues that I think are at the core of RIM ethics. Now, these issues actually are, appear in other professional contexts as well, in the other professions uh, I just listed, but they're uh, really central to uh, RIM ethics because it's, these, these issues are information-centric, so, so it's no coincidence. No coincidence. And they're also, uh, these, issue, these issues are also shared by the information professions, um, like, for example, uh, librarianship and, and archiving or archivy. So, the, you know, these are the, the, the issues I did identify as, as really being central to, to RIM ethics, and I would say that they're shared by a number of, of other disciplines, especially the information-centric ones. And so there's valuable information in, in the literature surrounding those other disciplines when, when building your own capacity. But a, a theme will be that uh, even though these are shared issues, and even though they're shared with very closely allied uh, disciplines, the specific problems that arise for a records professional will be slightly different from those that might arise for an archivist or for a, uh, a librarian. So that's what kind of the rubber hits the road when it comes to professional ethics and why you need distinctive bodies of, of guidelines for the different professions. One last point about this slide is that I'm, I'm indicating in the call-outs on the side that, that these uh, core ethical issues for which there's a, a, an, an ethical literature in general are also compliance issues. So if you're interested in uh, law or you look at legal literature and statutes and case law, and, and uh, regulations, you'll see that these, these issues also come up or are codified and addressed. And so in building your confidence, uh, keep in mind that this is, you know, the, the ethics part reinforces the compliance part, and the compliance part reinforces the, the ethics part, and they should be approached together. I would I recommend reading the literatures in both and being familiar with the relevant uh, laws, case law, and so forth, in, in both the compliance side and the, uh, and the ethics side. So why should you be uh, interested in RIM ethics, uh, both as an individual and, and, and as part of the profession? Well, the first, the first, uh, the first point is, of course, I think it's already been kind of indicated, is for self-protection. Uh, since there are now lots of risks in the, um, it, it, you know, in, in the professional context, you want to be uh, aware of those risks and how to deal with them, how to reason about them. You want to develop a vocabulary that helps you identify and communicate your concerns about risks that come up and, and have a, a framework for working through issues both in your own thinking and in communicating with others. So that's a very important thing, avoiding moral negligence and moral incompetence. You, you want to at least have some of the, the fundamental concepts at your disposal. Also, it's important for, for you as a professional, but also for the profession as a whole, to develop a more robust, comprehensive room ethics to elevate the profession. That's in part because it's, it's almost definitional that professions have an ethics. We'll talk about that in a little while, but it, it's almost like a, by many it's considered a necessary condition of being a professional as opposed to having an occupation, even if it's a highly skilled occupation. Um, also, uh, as everyone should know, the, you know, issues of compliance are becoming extremely important in the organization. Uh, there are, uh, lots of organizations have compliance efforts, compliance departments, and uh, for RIM to elevate its visibility within organizations and its stature, it would do well to 
to be conversant in those issues and, and have a seat at the table when developing such things as whistleblower programs or policies on information privacy. And finally, as a kind of last point, uh, there's a, I think all of us want to, in some ways to be able to serve society and, 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 and you know, answer to a higher calling and, and by engaging in professional ethics, this is a, an opportunity to do so. Now, this slide's meant to emphasize uh, the opportunity, not just the risk. I've been talking about the kind of risk situation that records professionals face um, for the reasons given earlier. But there's also an opportunity by virtue of those same reasons, you know, given the, you know, the fact that now you're stewards of, of information, personal information, and you also can see business processes more clearly because now they're mediated by computers. Given all that, um, there's an opportunity for records professionals to, again, get a seat at the table and participate in um, some of the important initiatives for business. And uh, just some of the areas here, let me just take again whistleblowing as the example. A lot of organizations are concerned about mitigating risk before it gets to regulators or the general public. Um, and so they've instituted uh, programs, they can call them hotlines sometimes, sometimes they're called uh, professional concerns programs and so forth. And those have to do with um, capturing concerns and getting them to the right people when channels of communication are being blocked by the, uh, the wrongdoers complicit in the wrongdoing. And so there's obviously, you know, it's obviously a situation where there are inform information flows, they're sensitive, they're confidential, and records have to be kept. Uh, so shouldn't records professionals be involved in that? And what's, what's keeping them from being involved in the design of those programs or uh, you know, in, in playing an important role and being a, a valued team member? And I think knowledge of the whistleblowing law, the ethics of whistleblowing certainly um, position them to uh, bring forward their skills to that, uh, to that problem. Okay, so that's kind of the motivation for uh, professional ethics. I'm going to talk a little bit more about ethical knowledge uh, and where, um, uh, you know, where, where RIM ethics fits in. Uh, if you look at these circles here, we're going to go into a little more depth here, but these circles represent domains of knowledge and the fact that the professional ethics and business ethics fall into the circle is significant. The fact that business ethics is an oval isn't significant, but the fact that they fall into the, the circle is significant. And what this suggests is that we do have a common framework of moral values, moral principles, moral knowledge, moral rules, and we apply them to a wide range of situations where we're in. And that includes the workplace, that, that includes our professional work. But because of professions and because business um, have their own special interests, uh, issues, and issues have become extremely complex because of technology, because of the capabilities that technology brings. Um, we have to articulate and develop these, these larger or more general ethical rules to address specific, specific issues. And so I see professional ethics as part of the common morality. You cannot justify an ethical position in business or the professions without appeal to common morality principles. Some people, some people might uh, suggest differently, but I don't think you can do that, but rather these are articulations of those principles. Also, when you, when you go back to this question I asked earlier, what are your responsibilities uh, as an individual, as a person who's a member of society, as a person who works for a company or a, uh, an agency, and as a professional, uh, when you go seeking answers, uh, this is kind of the, uh, the target to shoot at. Uh, you draw on the, your common morality and the relevant business ethical and professional ethical principles. Now this next slide, it, it contains a lot of information and a lot of assumptions and ideas about ethics. Um, I, I do on my website uh, that, that, that where I'm putting a, a lot of uh, uh, information about this. I do, I do have a, uh, a, a brief little paper on this that will explain it more, so I won't, I won't try to explain everything. But this kind of lays out uh, some of the content and structure of those circles I was just showing. Um, the idea being that we, we, again, we have a common morality. If you look at the very top, I don't know if it's my mouse, uh, you see my mouse. If you look at the very top, we have a, 
uh, some very some core principles I think of as the foundation of our morality uh, as the I would almost call them value dimensions of our morality that lay out a, a framework and uh, these are principles that are very general and shared across societies and historical periods and they, they're, they're used in, in trying to understand um, ethical problems. They include the, the principle of non-harm or non-maleficence, principles of autonomy, fairness, responsibility, and beneficence, and, and I'll come back to these, but these are high-level principles that, that encapsulate very general values. And this is, this is a, the framework for our common morality. More to the, the right are general moral rules that also make up the common morality, and these are rules such as, you know, do not uh, injure other people, do not kill, do not steal, and so forth. And if you notice, what these rules have in common is that they're really general to us as human beings living in social groups. I mean, for a very long time, we've been able to lie to each other and to injure each other. And so these rules are, you know, uh, have been in place, and, and really no, no society can function if these rules are flouted, even though they might be interpreted slightly differently. Um, so these, the principles and general moral rules make up our common morality. And there are some other concepts on this slide, too, that I won't address. But right in the middle, being represented a little smaller than it should be given its importance, are, 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 this, are what I call special ethical rules. And these are more specific rules worked out for specific contexts where there are problems that are, in a sense, unique to that particular context, like biomedicine, genetics, uh, you know, uh, information privacy, and so forth. And this is where uh, I situate professional ethics, and not just professional ethics, applied ethics or, or other things, but this is where they're, they're situated. And uh, these, are the, these rules are, are worked out by multiple stakeholders in the professions. But as you see from the arrows, they're worked out within our common morality through appeal to principles and through an articulation of some of our, our general moral rules. And so that's why I would situate um, Grim ethics. Notice also, I think this. Uh, I think you'll appreciate this as information professionals. Um, you can this representation of, uh, of our ethical knowledge is propositional. It's playing things out propositions. Um, it's information theoretic, and it can be hierarchical uh, if you, if you like it to be, and uh, taxonomic. You think I would think it'd be an interesting project to work out a taxonomy of moral concepts and principles because they do have a kind of hierarchical uh, structure. I'd say a couple of quick things about business ethics and professional ethics in general. Um, one of the things that you know, my, my circular diagram was meant to suggest is that part of one's knowledge of one's ethical obligations and the business context in which one works is going to include business ethics because businesses have created a, a wide range of ethical questions, starting with general questions of corporate social responsibility, what should businesses do for society, apart from providing their goods and services, uh, management issues, who should, you know, for whom should corporations be managed, uh, should it be managed for their shareholders or also employees, community, and so forth. That, the latter idea is called stakeholder management. And of course there are, uh, uh, there's a literature on on the, the, the role of employees, what they owe their uh, their companies, and what their companies owe them. Uh, issues of loyalty, uh, risk, uh, harassment, all these issues are part of a general debate in law and ethics about businesses. And the issues are many. They include marketing, they include safety, uh, sales, they include safety, uh, they include HR, they include employment contracts, many, many issues. Some of these issues will be directly relevant to some of the questions you face. When you're trying to understand your obligations, you look, back, you look at the general business context and the kinds of ethical obligations that are situated there. Also, it's, it's part of one's literacy and being able to work on compliance issues in an organization to have some familiarity with some of these concepts. Uh, stakeholder management and corporate social responsibility, I think, are pretty important in that regard because, uh, to some extent, they have a lot to do with the ethical culture of an organization. That is to say, which of these models is adopted uh, is very critical to the, the ethical context, and they call it the corporate culture. And that context and that culture 
can have a bearing on what your particular obligations are. So some some familiarity and liter literacy in this in the area of business ethics, I think, would be part of the educational process and building competence. And then, of course, there's professional ethics, which uh, similar in some ways to business eth ethics and different. Uh, it's 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 different insofar as professions are different. And what what's distinctive of professions? Well, again, there's a literature on professional ethics and attempts to define what a profession is. But one of the critical identifiers of a profession is, is a mastery of specialized knowledge, usually obtained through formal education, usually at the graduate level. Um, also, the idea of trust, often stemming from the having of that knowledge. Take medicine, for example. A doctor says to us, he's going to cut into us. We say, okay, you're the doctor. We don't say that to most people. It's because we put trust in professionals, we put trust in people who prepare uh, the financial statements for uh, an, orga uh, an organization. We put trust in people who audit those statements, even though because the, the accounting is horrendously difficult. Also, there's a public service dimension to professional ethics, which means above and beyond doing your work, you have an obligation to serve society through your work. There's autonomy given to professionals in discretion and how to do their work, which is not normally afforded to uh, people in occupations. And there are high standards of competence, due care and negligence principles, which will often be used when suing a professional in court for damages. So uh, the idea of professionalism carries with it some ethical obligations inherently that go beyond just the business ethical context. But the different professional ethics are, are differentiated, defined by the, again, the, co the core content of the, the work of the profession. And the ethics themselves take shape according to the value, the core value of the profession, um, the, the value at the heart of its work. And since the, the core mission of, of records managers is to create a, a, a a record uh, and evidence of corporate activity, their ethics falls out of that, that mission. And so I would, I would assert that the core value of records, of the records professional, professional ethics is accountability. And interestingly, accountability wraps up nicely with responsibility as a, as a kind, in, in some ways it's a form of responsibility. Responsibility meaning almost literally uh, being answerable to something. And responsibility is a very rich, rich concept. So if you recall from the previous slide, especially that complicated one with the uh, moral framework uh, depicted, um, responsibility is one of the fundamental moral principles. It's, it's really at the heart of our, of our moral system. And it's the heart of uh, complicated concepts like social responsibility, corporate responsibility, and so forth. So I think it's a very important thing about records that it connects with, you know, directly a, a, a core ethical value and gets gets its mandate from from that value, and that value shapes um, the, the the you know the, the ethics of, of RIM professionals as a whole. It, it permeates uh, the. Uh, uh, the profession and its, and its ethical responsibilities. And if I could try to illustrate that, I want, I want to do it by stepping back and reflecting a, a, a bit about how societies manage ethical risk. To, and I do this to illustrate why um, records is, is so important to the fundamental activities of, of businesses and organizations. Okay, so how do societies manage risk? Well, in this slide, I'm kind of giving you four different levels of risk and risk and response to risk. The first and the strongest level is prohibition. Some things are risky enough or serious enough that they're simply banned. And so lots of violence and other kinds of things are just outright banned. Conflict of interest is an area of prohibition. Giving gifts to public officials, for example, is prohibited. You cannot give your city council person a car. That is prohibited by California law. So it's just, there's just no, no toleration for that. There's no benefit from allowing it. At a lower level, but still strict level, is the concept of prior review. Some activities are considered uh, very valuable and important, but they are considered as having ethical risk. 
One example is medical research. Uh, medical research, you know, carries great benefits, but uh, human subject research requires prior review by uh, institutional bodies. Uh, and so the idea here is you know, the, the, the action is valuable, but before the action is undertaken, prior to its being undertaken, it has to be reviewed. And if, any, if anyone here is working on a, a thesis, you'll find even the social sciences fall in, in there, and you probably have dealt with what's called an IRB, the Institutional Review Board. Okay. The lower level of risk is, um, is monitoring. In this case, the activity is, is, is valuable and, and encouraged, uh, and, and, the, and the risk assessment is such that all that's required is the ability to periodically peek in and see what's going on. Um, of course, familiar to everybody is audits, and audit is a form of monitoring. So uh, you audit activities to make sure that uh, the organization is doing what's supposed to be doing and avoiding certain risks. And last, and the, the lowest level is investigability. Uh, you, may, you may view an activity as permissible and, and valuable, but uh, the society wants to be able to investigate wrongs that are done. They want, they want to do that after the fact or post hoc. Now, notice where records fits in most strongly here. Of course, it kind of fits in everywhere, but most importantly, it fits in in the areas of monitoring and investigation. Only by having a documentary record can you perform audits. Only by having a documentary record can you uh, post hoc investigate something. And notice these last two levels are really permissive levels in the sense that they allow the activities to happen. So if it were not possible to monitor or investigate post hoc, a great deal of business and organizational activity would be subject to prohibition or prior review. So I think that makes, that underscores the importance of accountability in organizations and records as an enabler and foundation of accountability, uh, I think, is, uh, is given its importance. Okay, now let me draw a quick comparison and move a little quickly. I see I'm running out of time. A quick comparison with other fields. The point I want to make with this slide is that even closely related fields have different focuses and different orientations and therefore will have different fundamental values and that will shape their ethics differently. And just to be real quick, we'll talk about librarianship. You notice that intellectual freedom is the heart of, of the uh, librarian's view of, of, of their professional ethics. But notice also intellectual freedom is a, a value with a history of thinking behind it. Um, this includes political philosophy. It includes uh, fourth, um, sorry, First Amendment uh, jurisprudence. And so um, if you're a librarian and you're interested in, in the ethical issues in your, in your profession, uh, you will you know, need to, in order to prepare for that, need to, to know something about uh, First Amendment jurisprudence and the rationale behind intellectual freedom, uh, transparency, uh, sharing of ideas, and so forth. Whereas for the records manager, even though you know, this might be important in some contexts, the main concern is organizational wrongdoing and providing the ability uh, of society to monitor and investigate organizations to hold them accountable. Um, so they're different, they're going to see different, different issues. Uh, there'll be some overlapping issues, but, but they have different orientations and different preparations. So if you're going to study law as a librarian, you may study uh, First Amendment jur jurisprudence. Uh, as a records official, you may uh, look at corporate wrongdoing law, Sarbanes-Oxley, the recent Dodd-Frank Act, and that kind of thing is being more relevant to, you, to the concerns you're, you're addressing. I won't say much about this in the interest of time, just trying to suggest that um, the, even though issues are shared across professions and um, the, the closely related uh, information professions, they don't face the same issues in the same way. Um, by, by giving ratings here of strong, weak, and so forth, I'm, uh, I'm thinking of a frequency with which a professional might face these issues uh, and also the intensity of the issues. And even beyond that, the, the, the particular kind of situation may be different. So let's take privacy. That's, that's shared strongly across all these different professions. And yet the librarian may face as a paradigmatic case to worry about the government uh, seeking uh, patron records. 
Um, whereas for the records manage, manager, uh, that could be a concern. If they work for Amazon, it could definitely be a concern, uh, and that's where the government would probably go now. But um, they'd also be interested in medical records, they'd be interested in web browsers, that kind of thing, because of the diversity of, of uh, kinds of context in which a records managers operate. So different issues will, will, will come, uh, come about. I'm assuming that records managers uh, have uh, faith whistleblowing is a very strong issue, whereas for the librarian, I, I may be wrong about this, but it doesn't come up as much unless, you know, a, a librarian is stealing uh, volumes of Melville or something. They, um, it's not going to be as, as frequent and as intense a situation, whereas intellectual property, very strong issue for librarians. Uh, partly, uh, certainly an issue for records for management, but not in the same same way. Okay. Now let me uh, in, in kind of end by uh, by tying a few things together. Um, the, the 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 moral framework we've been talking about, and um, kind of the structure of, of professional ethics and its relation to business ethics, and we do that by returning to the whistleblowing example. And this is a very complicated diagram. Um, and I'll try to explain it really, really quickly. But basically in the middle here, and again, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse, but in the middle I've, I've listed some commonly accepted principles about ethical whistleblowing. Making the assumption that a person is ready to, 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 to engage in whistleblowing, what's the ethical way of doing it? And there are some common percepts here, the idea being that uh, there's some, some kind of harm being, uh, you know, being carried out and, and the, the whistleblower can uh, prevent it, that they have evidence they can prevent it, they've gone through um, normal channels and been blocked and, and so forth. When working through that kind of ethical issue, my view is that you could work through it based on some of these general principles. The principle of beneficence, for example, would point you to the public good and the justification in terms of the public good. The principle of non-harm or non-maleficence would, would, would be about or, or concerned with preventing harm. And, there are, there, and I'm drawing on the literature and they, and they use these principles in this way. And the principle of responsibility would find something about your, your, your role and your position that would uh, provide a justification and perhaps a moral obligation to blow the whistle. So you can start dealing with the, the question of, uh, of whistleblowing by looking at our common morality and common mora morality Sorry, common morality principles and looking at the situation at hand, the, the kind of harms uh, being carried out by the organization. And that is a starting point and may, may suffice for uh, uh, a, a, an argument that you should blow the whistle. But also, the situation may require a, a evaluation from the point of view of your professional role. And some of the concepts like due care, standard of work, your fiduciary duties, these may actually come into the mix and provide their own justificatory train for, for the position or your position. Uh, they may create a stronger obligation. So if perhaps the principle, principle of non-maleficence didn't generate a really compelling argument for you to blow the whistle, your, your, you know, the guidance from professional ethics might. The same is true of business ethics. And also it could work the other way. As I started the discussion earlier, uh, loyalty is often seen as um, a counterweight to the public good and, and, and it creates a moral dilemma for the whistleblower. I think loyalty is probably overblown a little bit, but you can see that th there may be counter arguments. So maybe, maybe sometimes your professional role would, would call for you to do something different. And maybe in cases of whistleblowing, as a records manager, your professional role may um, require that you not blow the whistle, perhaps to um, capture a more complete record uh, to make the organization more accountable. So um, in working out a particular problem, you'll work from the perspective of your common moral principles, but also uh, professional ethics and the guidance from the profession and, and, uh, and, and business ethics. And so familiarity with uh, concepts that have across these different areas uh, I think is uh, critical to um, competently addressing the issues and being able to frame them. Okay. Uh, I think I'm doing okay on time. I just end by saying, okay, well the question is how, how now do I go about building some of this con uh, competence? 
Um, of course, you can start with your professional association. Uh, ARMA has a, a code of, of ethics, very brief, uh, very thin, but it still has one. Uh, and there, there are articles in, in, um, in its publications and, and books uh, that bear on compliance and ethics. Probably the, 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 there's more, more emphasis put on compliance. And most recently, the concept of information governance is coming into play. Uh, I view information governance as only having real meaning if, it's, if it has strong normative content. So I think that's a good, good area to look. Uh, allied professions have their, um, their uh, own uh, documents and authoritative documents on, on, on professional ethics and they cover some of these, these issues. Uh, the uh, American uh, Institute of Certified Public Accountants, that last one there, has a very, very extensive um, uh, inform, you know, you know, body of documents about, about its ethics. And in some ways I think accountants are more like records managers in their ethical role than people might first think. So I think it's a, it's a good model. Otherwise, there are lots of books on, um, on a lot of the issues, a lot of the core issues. They may not be uh, specifically addressed to records management, but there are books on information privacy, both books on the ethics and the, and the law. And then, of course, uh, everyone in records will find themselves doing some legal research uh, on regulations regarding um, uh, retention schedules and so forth. Um, if you want to have fun doing that, you could also look at uh, legal uh, law review articles and, uh, and legal books or uh, books of legal scholarship on some of these issues. Like again, information privacy. I would I would look at uh, I would look at books what they call secondary authorities uh, or in, in the legal profession books um, on on the law, information law, uh, and uh, uh, law review articles. Um, and, and if you, and if you want to go a little farther, even, even case law. So that's the kind of area where to, to some, some basic ideas about how to, uh, how to start building some competence uh, in, the, in the field. And uh, that's, that's it for me. I will, I guess, turn over the, the mic and take questions Thank however you, very much, you want to Norman. do that. Thank you very much, Norman. That was extremely interesting and timely. I think I will just thank you very much for attending. and. Uh, your um, website link is up in the chat area, so uh, all of you who are participating this evening, if you'd like to read more about Norman's work, you can visit his website. And I see a few people perhaps chatting, so uh, if you have anything to uh, say or, all right. Those are all thank you, so thank you very much, Norman.